Hello. This is Aaron Maller. I'm just uh, getting the uh, Zoom meeting started a few minutes early. Um, we'll uh, we'll wait till about 1 p.m. CST to get started. Hello. Uh, the drafting table behind me uh, is used for, uh, I guess at the moment, unfortunately, storing some books and some notes, but I actually really, uh, really miss using it. Um, I had that uh, Vemgo swing arm since college. I love that thing. I went through like two paraliners in school and then I was like, I've had it. I'm not putting cables in any more of these things. And I found that thing, actually that Vemco on, uh, on eBay, uh, for like 50 bucks because it's left-handed. So most folks, when they buy when you buy left-handed ones new, they're more money. Right. But, uh, when you buy them used, they have almost no secondary market. So it swings to the right. That way it's not, I'm not banging my arm on it. Um, it's actually a really fun drafting machine. I put some new blades in it. Um, back when I set up the table and, uh, that's the story there. For those of you just joining, we're just waiting a couple of minutes until, uh, until 1 PM. Uh, if you have any questions or anything in the meantime, you can pop them up in chat. So we're just, uh, all talking about my old Vemco drafting table that's back there actually just the Vemco swing arm. The table is like the cheapest thing in the world from a student supply store from Buffalo. Gordon says the table is too far away to be the cat throne. That's true. The cat's throne is actually underneath my desk, uh, right up against my feet. Um, and uh, Stephen says, hello. Hi, Steve. Uh, it's like 12.59 here. I'm going to give everybody like one or two extra minutes just because I know people are probably like trying to set up Zoom and all that good stuff. <clears throat> and then we'll, uh, we'll, uh, we'll get going. Um, Micah, let's, uh, Micah asks, what are the plans for when Bimla server gets uh, deprecated for Hive? So, um, I did ask that question uh, to uh, CTC recently, and obviously I don't speak for them, um, but uh, I'm going to just say my expectation is that uh, Bimless server will be around for a while and uh, we'll be able to keep using it. Um, we'll talk about that, uh, about why I'm using Bimless server versus Hive uh, in a couple of minutes. Um, it's 3 p.m. Uh, for for some folks, so that's two time zones ahead. Cool. I'm just going to give everybody like two more minutes. I know it's 1 o'clock, but figure lunch and Friday and all that good stuff. While we're just uh, while we're just waiting for to kick off, uh, Micah, I will tell you actually the uh, the, the the funny thing is. Uh, after having 
meandered through several content navigators. If for some odd reason something was to happen to to Bimla server, our next stop is going to be to uh, to make our own because uh, it seems like every few years we go through something a little different. But this is working really well for right now, and uh, it seems like it's going to be around for a while. So uh, we'll go with that. Yeah, the headset cannot interfere with the coffee. That's not going to go well. Silence my phone so I'm not that guy. OK, well, I mean, we'll we'll just start, because I know uh, everybody's got stuff to do on Friday afternoon. Um, and uh, will I record? Nancy's asking if I will record this. Yes, it's already being recorded. Uh, and we'll. Uh, uh, I will send out an email after with a link to the video um, after it's done processing. So I do apologize that you will get one email from us uh, unsolicited, uh, just in case you want the video. Um, so anyways, uh, my name's Aaron Maller from Parallax Team. If you don't know who I am, of course, if you don't know who I am, I'm not sure how you ended up here, which is kind of interesting. Um, and uh, the short version of the story is uh, about a year ago, we started having to look for a new content navigation system for a number of reasons. Um, I'm very opinionated, and I had very specific requirements of what I wanted and how we wanted it to act. And uh, all of the tools that were out there didn't do um, exactly what we wanted. So we ended up kind of, uh, well, we're, we are using one particular content navigation system as the actual tool, but then we also ended up like hodgepodging with a bunch of other tools over the top of it um, that in combination get us all of the things that we wanted to have. Um, so I apologize if I talk very fast. Uh, there's like four or five different things I want to go over in the hour to kind of show you how we got to where we got to. And I promise we won't really hang out in PowerPoint a whole lot. Um, that's more to make sure I don't zip ahead in one long run on sentence and tell you everything all at once. So um, where's my mouse? There we go. So a couple quick things. Um, the first thing I want to talk about is actually what were the requirements that we were looking for? Because uh, inevitably, every time I go through this discussion with a firm that asks about content management and content navigation and I show them what I do, they're like, ah, it seems like there's a much simpler way to do this. And, uh, you know, what if we just what if we just put the content here? Or what if we just use a system like this? Or why do this at all? And so I want to go over exactly what it is that I wanted from a content navigator um, to start off. Uh, and then uh, we'll go over, we're going to go over like five different tools, uh, the specific tools that we're using. Um, three, four, three or four of them are pay tools, but they don't—they're not all the actual content navigation tools. So we'll go over what each tool is doing and how that's helping our process. Um, how we piece them all together, which again you'll see little snippets, and then in the last 15 minutes we'll kind of pull it all together with how we're managing uh, all of the computers that use the content navigator. And uh, I'll actually—we will open up two different computers uh, during the demo. Um, uh, my computer, obviously, that we're on, and another computer, as long as technology doesn't fail me like it did two hours ago. And uh, I'll show you kind of the differences in uh, what we call in the office mode versus travel mode, which is a really important piece of our overall puzzle. Um, and thank God it's Friday, because uh, holy cow, today kind of feels like a Monday. So we'll we'll just say thank God it's Friday. Um, OK, so here's the thing. Um, this is obviously just a presentation I thought would be entertaining just because I was piecing together a bunch of different providers' tools. Um, this does not mean that I am the end-all, be-all of deciding what is a good content navigator. A ton of you on the call are probably going to disagree with me. Um, so let's just get this out of the way. These are the criteria we were using based on how I believe content navigation should work. So there are two vastly different kinds of content navigators out there. There are ones that use very minimal real estate, you know, basically as, as little space as possible to find the content you need and drag it into the project. And then there are content navigation or content management systems, as they're calling them, that take up like the whole damn screen. Um, if that's your thing and that's what you're into, I don't, uh, I don't begrudge you any of that. It's just not for me. Um, some of you may know that I'm actually from an AutoCAD background before I was uh, a Reviteer, and uh, the design center and the tool palettes were actually really great. They, were, they sucked to set up, but they were really great. You saw your content, you dragged it in, life was good. That's really all I ever wanted out of a content navigator. 
Um, I don't want something that makes me need to pull up another entire monitor so that I can open this thing and see all this data and all this information. Um, if you're really asking about all the data in the Content Navigator, I'm going to be kind of a jerk and tell you that I think it's mostly useless. So that's another whole conversation, but we'll, uh, we'll get there. So the different Content Navigators that are out there, um, people basically also have two differing schools of thought in how you should anticipate your users navigating. There's pre-configured browsing, which is my preference. I like to know rote rehearsal. If I'm working on core and shell, there's going to be a doors tab. I click on doors, and that's where all of my doors are. Um, a lot of the solutions out there are 100% primarily search reliant, where you go and you type in the word door. And if I see one more content management demo where somebody has to type in the word door, I'm seriously going to lose my stuff because architects and engineers do not want to type in door or type in column or type in beam every day, especially since unless they're typing one hand and it now means removing your hand from your mouse to type the word door. It's kind of ridiculous. I'm not a fan of primarily search reliant, so I like something pre-configured. Um, and again, I'm, I'm telling you all these things. So if you watch this demo and you're like, why the hell is this content set up this way? You'll kind of understand. So this third one's kind of a big deal uh, for us at Parallax, and that does not mean that this is the ideal solution for everybody, but a really big difference in a lot of the content management systems out there is where does the content live? Uh, there is basically, and I, I kind of combine network, LAN, and local, but I mean, basically that's two different things. There's on your network or on your actual computer, um, but all of those are, are similar. And then there is the whole internet slash cloud-based, you know, whether you're looking at something like you know, Autodesk Vault or CTC's Hive product that we were talking about in the chat a couple of minutes ago, or something like Unify or, uh, or something else, there are a bunch of solutions out there that will allow you to actually store your cloud up in the internet. Um, I, I don't recall if it's still available, but there was even a version of Bimless Browser that allowed you to put your content up in the cloud. But I think that may be, well, we'll ask CTC about that later. Here's the deal with that. Um, for Parallax, content in the cloud or on the internet, not really a viable solution. Most days it is, because most days we're actually in the office. And by we, I mean it's me and John Pearson, obviously. And John's in an office that's at his house, and I'm in an office that's above our house. But uh, most days we're in an office, which means the content can live anywhere. We have internet. It could be on the internet, or it's on our server, or it could be on our C drives, uh, whatever. The point is the content is accessible all the time. The thing is, we're not always in the office. And I would say it's probably 30, 40% of the time I'm either on a job site. And by lousy internet, I mean like 10 meg download for all 100 people to share. So people's opinions vary on acceptable user experience, but the amount of time it takes to pull a meg and a half family uh, down from the internet on a 10 meg pipe that 100 people are sharing, for me, no bueno. So for me, that's not okay, uh, which means I want my content solution to be running off my C drive when I'm not physically connected to my office. Um, and that was one of the driving factors that kept us away from a lot of the other content products that a lot of you were using. So if you look at anything that stores content on the internet, it's not that I don't like the tool, it's that the internet for me is kind of a deal breaker as far as uh, storing content. So you're also gonna see some complications in our setup, uh, like, the way our computers are set up now, on days that we are physically in a Parallax office, our content browser is running live off of our, our uh, network. But then when I'm traveling, it's actually running off the C drive, which means there's a process that we go through whenever we leave the office. Uh, you'll discover it's just a single double click, which is not a, a big deal. Uh, but we do go through this process every time we leave the office. And a lot of folks are like, well, that's dumb. You could just run off the C drive uh, every day. Um, and it could update from the network every day. And uh, if you were to talk to John Pearson, uh, he would explain to you that the other day, like uh, a total ass, I lost four hours of work because I was editing something on my C drive and didn't realize it. So that's why I don't like to do that, because um, I'm not always paying attention to what I'm doing. So uh, to start off, uh, the browser that we're using now is uh, the CTC uh, Express Tools Bimless Browser. Um, I'm just going to give you some bullet points before I actually show it to you. So the one we're actually using is called the Bimless server, uh, and there are a couple. So there are a couple different variants. So the Bimless browser you can download for free. Uh, you can run it on your machine. Uh, basically, you can put the content on your machine as well, and it's just like a content navigator. It's basically like Windows Explorer, but it's running inside Revit. Pretty handy. Bimless server lets us like put the content up on a network, and then multiple machines can access the same database of content. 
So, you know, that is your kind of quintessential, if person BIM manager goes and adds a new tab into the browser, everybody sees that tab the next time they click on the group or click on the content or whatever else. Um, I wanted things to be really simple. I wanted to drag and drop the content. Um, I'm not, I'm not looking to, you know, cure cancer of content navigation. I just want to find my cabinets and drag them in a project. And, and that's what I was after. So uh, it serves that purpose. Um, and again, going back to uh, pre-configured navigation, it lets basically uh, whoever is setting it up in the admin console decide what's going to be tabs, what's going to be groups of tabs, and you can break it into different databases and so on and so forth. Uh, so it has an admin console. That's kind of where you go to uh, administer everything. Now, what we're going to talk about a little later is uh, the content is all basically indexed and information about it is stored in a database. Um, there are a lot of firms that are happy about all of the content management solutions moving to a database. A lot of you may remember uh, for years I was using a very, very simple content navigator. It ran on text files uh, that, just in, that just listed directories, didn't actually store any information about the content. I'm not going to lie, uh, that made life for me much simpler because all of the information in the database I don't actually care about. So um, having content in a database makes what I want to do with a browser a little tougher but we'll, uh, we'll get to that in a few minutes. So uh, we'll take a peek real quick. We'll bounce out of PowerPoint for a few minutes. And uh, so this is basically what I'll just call, you know, our parallax Revit environment, uh, the way things are set up uh, when, you, uh, when, when one of the two of us uh, turn on a machine and open Revit. So our BIMless browser is hanging out over on the right side. And like I said, um, I, personally enjoy something with a minimal UI. I mean, yeah, you can rip it off and put it on a second monitor um, if, you're, if you're into that. Um, I started using Revit in like 2006, like 32-bit windows, single monitors and all that. So even though we've now got like 8 billion monitors, I never really got into ripping stuff off the screen and putting it elsewhere because at the end of the day, it's just more mouse movement to get over there. So uh, we've got our browser. Uh, you can break it up into different groups. Um, and groups can all have different tabs in them. So for instance, while I'm in my interiors group, I've got, uh, you know, our new Parallax Millwork Library, uh, which, you know, uh, is a lot of fun. But then if I go down to Division 14, I've got elevators and circulation and whatnot. Uh, and if we go up to restroom accessories, and then, for instance, we just go to pull something in. So like, here's a toilet stall. That's basically the functionality I was after. Um, wanted to just be able to drag content in, have it load into the project. Um, wanted it to instantiate the proper placement method, which is actually kind of a big deal. And a lot of the content navigators were getting that wrong until like 2017. Meaning if you loaded a face-based family, uh, the place on face button was not the active button. You couldn't actually place the content. So that was a bit uh, of an annoyance, but so they got that worked out uh, in a lot of the browsers, uh, not just the Finless browser. And so that's basically uh, what I was after. If you wanted to look around at it a bit more, uh, obviously families that have different types, you can expand and get to the types. Uh, if you go to families that have type catalogs, you can expand and see the different types from the catalogs as well. Um, the, uh, it's actually kind of interesting. Uh, in my earlier uh, content navigator days, um, you know, a lot of add-in manufacturers basically build a single add-in that runs in multiple versions of Revit. Bimless browsers the same way. So as you update your Revit Express tools, it's running in, the same browser is running in 16 and 17 and 18 and 19, but they give you a settings file where you can tell it to filter the different databases for each version of Revit. So we have ours. So the 18 version of Revit only shows the 2018 browser uh, and so on and so forth, which is kind of cool. Uh, if you wanted to just see the admin console, we'll open this up real quick. So uh, the console basically lists out all of your different groups uh, in a tree structure, and then you can see all of the different tabs for those groups uh, once it becomes active here uh, in a second. So we'll just let that hang out. Now, what we're going to want to talk about in a couple of minutes, by the way, so here's the database. And of course, we're in the interiors group right now. So if you look at interiors, you'll see all of the different uh, tabs that I have set up. Uh, and if you were to go into any of the different tabs, like base cabinets, you'd see um, our, our newish library of, uh, of base cabinets. Um, this is basically just a UI for the database, by the way. 
Um, and I'll just show you this really quick. Uh, so when you're using Bimless server and you actually put this on a, uh, a Windows server machine somewhere, what it's doing is it's giving the database basically a GUID and on your server, so we're actually basically, we're backdoored into the server that's running Bimless server right now, there is an actual database file. Um, and it's large. Uh, we've got about 4,000, I think, 4,500 pieces of content. So it's about 480 megs right now. Um, but this is going to become important uh, towards the end of the hour. So what essentially happens is the entire database GUID folder on your server actually gets mirrored down by Bimless server to your user profile on your local computer. The database file, by the way, and we're actually going to talk about this a little later, um, database file is kind of interesting because you can actually, oh, no, Notepad++ is freaking out. Uh, this is the part we were afraid was going to be a little glitchy if we tried to show this to you. But uh, you can actually just open that 500 meg database in a notepad program. And this is going to become uh, important towards the end of the hour as we start to show you um, how everything gets migrated around in our office. So I think as long as I don't try to keep touching notepad++, we'll be able to finish our demo. But there's a couple of interesting things I want you to see here. So inside the database, each family is given a GUID, and each family is also keeping track of the path to that actual family. So of course, these paths are reading off of our server because that's where everything is stored. So the admin console basically has the full list of content that exists inside uh, all of these folders, and it also keeps track of which content needs to be updated in the database, meaning the content's been updated in Revit, but the database has not been re-indexed, uh, or those pieces of content have not been re-indexed since that point. So once every few days, I basically bounce into the content update tracker, select all the families, and hit update. Uh, it's going to list the ones that have been updated versus the ones that have been added, which is uh, really cool. Um, so for a couple of clients that we actually manage this for, um, one of, our, one of our bigger clients, a multi-office client on the East Coast, they run Bimless Server as well. And since we build their content for them, we basically just remote into a Citrix machine, open up their Bimless admin, and just you know, goof around with their database, which is not creepy at all. So anyways, uh, here you go. And it'll basically list which content is updated. Uh, you'll notice like all of my annotations are updated because we're working on template changes. So basically selecting them all and hitting update would update the database. We're not going to do it uh, because we don't need to be doing that on the demo right now. OK, so get back into here. Uh, so one of the things I'm sure you noticed about the Bimless server that I was just showing you is that it obviously has preview images for the families themselves. Um, if we were to go back to those two folders I just showed you, one folder was on the server itself and one folder was on my uh, local computer in my user directory, uh, there's basically just a folder called cache. And in the cache, uh, it has an image of every component that's in the library. Um, you're not required to make those images yourself. So uh, Bimless server makes those images, I assume, when they are first loaded in or when they are indexed into uh, the Bimless browser. Obviously, it's using the, uh, the RFA's uh, thumbnail preview, um, I believe. So you know there are some funky cases where you get things. Uh, you get families that have kind of strange previews. You get the face-based families that have the wacky look to them, and they're backwards, and all that kind of good stuff. Um, so um, since we know where these images are on the server, the Windows server that's running the Bimless server uh, application, if you will, um, we tried this a few years ago. And obviously, you can just make your own images for all the families. And then you can shove those images onto the Bimless server. And that will actually uh, populate down uh, to users. So um, what's really neat about this is the first time uh, we tried doing this. It was two and a half years ago for our uh, large client that was using Bimless Server. And I actually have to give some props to CTC on this one um, because back in 2016, when we went to do this, um, inside that cache folder where all the preview images are stored, they were not named the family name. The images were actually named with the GUID of the family that was inside the database. So in order for us to be able to generate our own images and then translate the names into GUIDs, we had to get into some uh, 
horrible kind of uh, PowerShell goofiness, uh, if you will. And I say horrible because like if you're if you're Gordon or somebody like John who's into coding and scripting, I'm sure it's not that bad. But this was like two days of hell for me. So that's another story. But props because now the folders that are storing all of those images uh, actually store them as the family name. So you'll see a bunch of preview images here. Uh, obviously, we're in the annotations. So you'll see here's my door preview images. Uh, and so once we have all the preview images that we like, we can then force them into the cache on the BIMless server. And that basically gets us where we want to go in terms of a nice user experience uh, similar to what you're seeing over here. This particular tab of images I just redid a few minutes ago while I was experimenting for today. So naturally, they're not all correct now. Uh, and we're going to talk about that uh, for the next few minutes. Um, so let's get back up here and go back into here. Uh, OK. OK, so now uh, we know that we can change the images in the BIMless browser if you want. By the way, if you go in the admin console, you can also change the size of the preview image. So if you want them to be bigger, uh, inject a little more clarity for users, you can change that as well. So um, for a number of years, I was actually doing something a little uh, over the top, and I was actually generating all of my preview images for content inside the project environment. You could do things like turn on shadows and turn on ambient occlusion. I was literally scripting screen capture software to basically do that um, so that I could get the images I wanted. Why was I doing this? Well, at the time, <clears throat> there wasn't an automated routine out there that would help us get good enough preview images. Keep in mind, when I was doing that, there also was no uh, preview visibility in the family editor, uh, which there is now. Um, and uh, there wasn't an app like Preview Image Generator, which uh, Parley Burnett, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, who's also on the call, uh, came out with, uh, I want to say, about a year ago now, maybe a little less, maybe a little more. Uh, time flies when you're, uh, I don't know, time flies. Anyways, uh, so Parley came out with this thing called Preview Image Generator. Uh, you can check it out at thepig.io. Um, I kept forgetting the word the, and I was searching for pig, and just don't, just thepig.io. Anyways, um, there's two versions of it. There's a free version and there's a pay version. Uh, the pay version pays itself back in like four minutes because it basically lets you just point to an entire library and say, reprocess all these families. Okay. Uh, what's really cool, and we're going to run this in a second so you can see how it works, but what's really cool is it lets you have different settings set up for different categories of families. So if you want your uh, door previews to look a certain way, you can do that. If you want your, um, if you want your, uh, your casework families to look a different way, uh, you can uh, do that as well. And I'll show you how that works. Uh, so what's really kind of interesting about this, and this is both an awesome thing and a terrible thing, depending on how strict you are with your standards, but uh, you can have Pig create a 3D view and name it whatever you want. Um, and when we get into the end of the hour where we're talking about journal files, just realize that you want to be really, really consistent with what you decide to do. Because later when you go to open a view by that name, um, you'll want to know exactly what the name is and not keep changing your mind. Uh, again, uh, and I forget what your project preview visibility came out in the family editor. I want to say it was 16. Maybe it was 17. I don't exactly recall. Um, but uh, Pig allows you to turn that on. It, it also allows you to basically, whoops, uh, I guess I left that note out. It also lets you do things like hide light sources, hide connectors, hide reference planes, I think, uh, and a few of those other things. So that makes it super handy for uh, wanting to generate your preview images. So I've got it installed. Uh, and since I've got the, uh, the pay version, we can use the batch generate button. And we'll basically say, I'm going to load an entire batch of families. Um, here's what I will tell you. I recommend doing this a small directory at a time. Uh, I told a couple of computers to start processing all 4,000 families in our library uh, because we have four versions of the library now, and I, I regretted that. I, I had no computers for a few days. So uh, same location or save them to a new location. We're going to go same location, and we're going to pick this thing. Uh, I've got a directory on my desktop just so that I don't jack up my uh, actual library. Not that it would jack it up, but we don't need new preview images right this minute. So here's what's cool. Okay? It's going to find the families, and then it's basically going to show you what their current preview is. Now, what I've done, uh, because when I went to do my 
dry run of this presentation, obviously I've already run pig on all of the parallax content. So everything from here down, they're already all perfectly lined up at the same corner and they're all using the same visual style. So doing the demo of pig was not going to be super convincing. So I downloaded and threw some uh, null furniture um, just into a folder so that we have something that you can look at. So you'll see here their preview images are kind of all different, uh, not really in the same orientation and stuff. And so uh, before we run it, I'll just show you the settings that you can have here. So you can basically pick, uh, you know, what's the default appearance that you want to use for anything that you haven't specified otherwise. So you can pick a corner uh, or a floor plan or an elevation or whatever. You can pick a visual style. Uh, this is really interesting to me because uh, I had done all of my libraries in realistic mode and then realized that was dumb because not all the families had the materials in them. So then I'm going back now and putting them all back in shaded mode. Um, you can pick different level of detail. And again, if you want, you can also start to add in new settings. So we can say, you know what, if it's an air terminal, maybe I don't want a 3D view because I'm gonna be looking at the backside of a diffuser. So maybe I want to be looking at like uh, what it looks like in the floor plan view and we'll put it at hidden line mode or whatever. That way we'll see what we want to see. I don't have any air terminals in this demonstration, so that's not really going to do anything. But we'll save that and we'll just tell it to run. So pick a folder. By the way, if you do get brave and tell it to run on 4,000 families, uh, make sure you have a lot of memory in your workstation. This is one of those interesting families, right, where there's a goofy issue with the preview. Um, and that happens all the time in Windows Explorer. I'm sure you've seen it. So it's kind of cool when this starts running because it will uh, rebuild the previews and take care of those issues for you. So you'll see it starting out with the null furniture now. There it goes. While that's running, um, I noticed that uh, somebody, uh, Chad, posted a picture in Q&A and asked, uh, does it have to be a Windows server or will a NAS work fine? Um, Chad, I'm not sure if you're talking about the device that the actual BIMless server service has to run on or if the content can be on a NAS, so I'll answer it both ways. Um, the BIMless server uh, kind of hosting application is very similar to like FlexLM. So there's actual, there needs to just be a computer that's running, I believe, Windows server um, that is actually holding that application, uh, we could verify with CTC whether or not it actually has to be Windows Server or just a dedicated machine or something. I'm not entirely sure. Uh, we have a machine set up, basically, that's running Windows Server 2012 uh, or 2016, and, and that's what Binless Server is running on. Uh, in terms of the actual storage, uh, both of our servers are NAS devices, so I'm certain they work fine. Um, I don't want to dive into the weeds, into the, that aspect of it, but I can tell you, I mean, uh, just a personal belief, I don't use drive letters for anything. So I do full UNC path for, uh, for everything. Um, just the reason I bring that up is uh, because all kinds of, not just with, not with the CTC tools, but all kinds of issues in general show up when you're using uh, drive letters. So essentially we don't use any of them here. Um, uh, Cody from CTC did just respond, by the way, and says it can just be a dedicated computer. It doesn't actually have to be running Windows Server. Uh, so that's cool. Uh, don't need to buy Windows Server. Okay, so uh, this is running. And again, what you're going to see here is that Pig is, because I had done my doors, like I said, in realistic mode, which was stupid, uh, it's now converting them back to uh, shaded mode. Um, and it's running through and generating these previews. So uh, while that's going on, uh, one thing to mention is I, I caught up with Parley, who makes the pig tool uh, right before this demo, just to check with him. So they're working on a new version uh, that's obviously going to be coming out so that it's uh, 2019 compatible. And it also allows you to hide, I think, a few more things. I'm not sure what a full list of those things are, but I would check with Parley at his website. Um, and uh, we did talk about at some point in the future it would be neat if uh, Pig could actually create these images and then export them to an image file for us as well. At the moment, it doesn't do that, uh, but that's okay because getting these images created is, is uh, more than good enough for what I wanted it to do. And we're gonna run through how to get the images out on our own um, as soon as this is done. I sort of regret putting 109 families in this folder because um, now we just have to watch it run. No, I'm just kidding. We'll do some other stuff while we wait. Uh, okay, so uh, when this is done, we're going to want to get these images out. 
right? Because we're going to want to put them, we're going to want to put them basically in our BIMless server. And for that, uh, what I'm using is uh, something super ghetto, uh, which is basically uh, Revit journal files. Yeah, see, I always, whenever I go back into my PowerPoint, I go a slide back, which is just lousy. Uh, so Revit journal files have been around uh, at least as long as I have in Revit. I think they've probably been around since the beginning. Um, I, I forget what the deal is with these. I think they're not officially supported. They're like a regression testing something or other. But here's the thing. They were created and given to us by Autodesk. Uh, I don't remember if it still actually ships with Revit or not, but basically they, they give you a journal file that is meant to batch upgrade uh, entire directories of families and content to the current version. Before there was a real API, um, you know, now there's a thousand apps that do it. I mean, uh, there's a, you know, CTC has a batch upgrade utility. Um, I know John's actually made a node in Rhythm that will update uh, entire directories of content as well. Um, and before there was Dynamo and before there was the API, uh, there were these batch files. Um, they are good for basically doing the same task in a hyper repeatable fashion over and over. And what I mean by hyper repeatable is the downside of a journal file is it cannot handle any unanticipated uh, occurrence. So if you tell it to, if you tell it to click on a view and that view is not found, the journal's over. It stops running. If you tell it to, if you tell it to go file save instead of file save as, and it gets a warning that says this file already exists, journal's out. So, so they're they're really finicky to use, um, but they're really good at certain kinds of tasks. Like if you have 4,000 files and you're getting ready to up, upgrade to 2019, you can copy your library from 18 to 19 and you can run a journal file and it can do an upgrade. Again, now it's probably not the right tool to use because there's other apps out there that do this that are more stable and better and all that kind of good stuff. Um, there are some other interesting things you can do with journal files, uh, like changing the standards in your families. And again, now a lot of the... Uh, a lot of the tools that are on the marketplace will do this for you as well. Um, but I'll show you basically some journal file things that I've done over the years. We've got a little directory of them here. Um, and these are, I mean, they're finicky, but if any of you want to play with these, just reach out. At one point we had them hosted on a website um, and you could download them. And then I think that website went away because I'm a dumbass. I don't know. I don't remember what happened there. Uh, okay, so uh, essentially what they what Autodesk used to give us, there were these two little files called upgrade RFA and upgrade RFA.txt. So you would drop them in the root directory of your library and one of them would create a family list. It would create a list of all the families that were there. And if you were to open the text file, you'd find not a whole lot of super interesting stuff in here. It's, uh, it's a Revit journal file. Um, and basically, it's just told to look for the list of families that the batch file creates. And then all it does is it goes file open, file save as, use the same file name, and then file close. And it does that for every item in the text directory that it creates when you run upgrade rfa.bat. So all I ended up doing, oh, I just, okay. I meant to not do that. So because I have the database open in Notepad++, if you double click this, it freaks out. Um, all I've been doing for the last few years is anytime I need to do something really repetitive on a bunch of families. Uh, so here is the section that does file open and here is the section that does file save as. So if you just put a bunch of extra spaces in there and open Revit and do whatever task you want to automate and then close Revit, and then go find your actual journal file, you can literally rip out the lines that you need and paste them right here. You generally have to do a little cleanup. It's not exactly that simple, but uh, there's a bunch of interesting things that we've done over the years. Uh, so there's a list here. Um, essentially, uh, object styles, line styles, line types, and line patterns. So this one right here is a journal file that will uh, open a family. And uh, here's, here's what you'd have to edit, right? It's looking for a particular project that's on my desktop. So you'd have to edit this to be your desktop and your project file. But basically it says, open a project file, then open the family, then do transfer project standards and pull in all this stuff. Um, by the way, don't transfer object styles 
from a project into a family. It's horrible. I was doing something very particular here, um, but it does work. So that's one example. Um, really, a really silly one is uh, like back in 2015 or 16, we got that alphabetize all the parameters in your family button. So, uh, and again, a lot of the add-ins do this now. I believe the CTC family processor does this now, but if you wanted to, you could basically use a journal file, open every family, reorder the parameters, close all the families. Uh, so the reason this is important is uh, we've got uh, the pig finished making uh, previews, uh, made 109 previews. So we're going to close that. Uh, and now I'm going to basically just exit Revit entirely. Um, because if you want to run a journal file, the way you do it is you actually drag the journal onto the Revit icon. So we have our upgrade RFA.bat. And these are all the families that we just processed. So, oh, well, yeah, we've got all the backup files in there too. Uh, and backup files stink. So what I'm going to just do real quick is grab my little backup deleter. Autodesk used to give us one of these too. Um, but the Autodesk one didn't run on my old company's network because it was a batch. So this just goes through and deletes all the backup files. So they're gone. So now we have all these nice images. And this is what Pig does, by the way, is it now makes it so that in Windows Explorer, all the content looks nice. We're looking at them all from the same angle. Um, it's fantastic. But I also want those images for my family navigator. So uh, we're going to run the bat. And all that's going to do is kick out a list of families. I'm going to double click it again because I'm a dummy and I said I wasn't going to do that. Just close the database. Oh, I regret that. I wanted that open, I think. So. Here's the thing. It's just a list of all the families. Um, what I am going to do, just because after doing this a bunch, I know that this always turns into a problem, is we've, we've made this journal file, if you will, to basically open the family and, well, let's just look at the journal file. So we've told it, open the family, and then go to the view called thumbnail image. And that's the view that we told Pig to create. So we know it's going to be there. And that's, again, important because uh, journals are not flexible in how they behave. So we said, open the thumbnail image, uh, turn on preview family visibility, and then basically export a, an image file to the temp drive of my computer. Uh, we're using the temp drive because, again, you don't want to get into like file path changes and all that stuff, or this isn't going to work. So uh, having created that, uh, the deal is that preview image is a 3D view. So all I'm going to do in this family list real quick is there are some detail components in here, and they're not going to run because they don't have uh, a 3D view. So if you run it, it's just going to error out when it gets to those families. So I figured we would just kill that, and we're ready to go. So now journal files are you take the journal, and you drag it down to your awesome Revit 2018 icon. Ours has a little 18 on it, thanks to whoever on Twitter made those icons. It was really cool. And you just basically sit back and let the, uh, let the journal file run. I'm going to laugh, by the way, if this doesn't work, uh, because uh, I tried it an hour ago and it worked. Uh, Chad's asking a question that says, does journal processing still need to be local files instead of server-based files? So the deal is it will run on a server. Uh, it will just save them as some completely bizarre names. Uh, it'll basically throw a GUID either at the front or the end of the family name, and it's just a total disaster. So I would copy the entire directory to your desktop and run it from there. Um, and the other thing is this is going to vary firm by firm. I can't say for sure, but a lot of offices that I've been in uh, won't let the batch utility run on the network anyway, even though all the batch is doing is actually generating the list of families. But for security, they've, they've uh, stopped batches from running on the server. Um, at which point you'll want to move it to your desktop anyway. So this is the journal file. And uh, what it's doing while it runs, is that Gordon messaging me? Uh, yeah, it is. He's messaging me while he's in the presentation, dork. Uh, OK, sorry. Uh, while this is running, if we were to go to C temp, that's just where I told the images to go, you'll see that uh, it's kicking out the different images uh, for all the families now. Keep hitting refresh. By the way, I have to give them credit. So this is actually in the null library, and it's like modeled like that out of individual little segments. I can't decide if I'm happy about this or not, but um, props to whoever at null knows how to model like that. It's pretty cool. Or whoever they farmed it out to, I guess, if we're being real. Okay, so uh, 
let's assume that this is finished running. I'm going to let this run for a little bit because uh, obviously it's going to take a little while, but it's going to make those 109 images. Now, if we were just doing this manually, if we weren't worried about our entire uh, our entire setup at Parallax, we would just take those images and then drop them inside the cache directory of the BIMless browser, and we would call it a day, and everything would be great. Uh, and that 100% works. Okay, so that's how you can basically make your custom uh, your custom images, and you can get them into your BIMless server. Um, but if you remember at the beginning. We were talking about a few other complicated things that we wanted to do. Uh, and it's a concept that we call relocate, right? So I want to just talk about this for a few minutes. Uh, right now, my machine is in what I call office mode. And that's more than just a Revit setup. Um, and I'm opening all these windows because I had them prepped for this presentation and I didn't want to close them. But when I'm in office mode, there's more than just Revit libraries to think about, right? So these are all basically shares on the server. If I go to where our Revit directory is, this is basically our Revit libraries that we work in every day. Uh, so you'll see that we're on our NAS device and then we're in the Revit share. If I wanna see the AutoCAD share where our CUIX files and our profiles are stored, I click on the AutoCAD share. You know, if you want your typical firm marketing stuff, you've got marketing stuff. And if you want your project directory, we've got project directories and that kind of good stuff, okay? So in addition, um, I don't know how many folks here are AutoCAD users or Civil 3D or AutoCAD MEP or any of that stuff, but I'm sure those of you that are do realize that AutoCAD shortcuts, if you're actually setting up AutoCAD with a CUIX and all that good stuff, AutoCAD shortcuts are like the nastiest thing in the world because they're shortcuts to the, the executable that also then list a profile which may be stored on your network. So as it turns out, if you travel a lot, uh, if you're using out of the box AutoCAD setup, it's totally fine. But if you travel a lot and you use custom CUIXs, basically your AutoCAD also uh, toots a big one when you try launching it from a Starbucks, which is not very fun. All of this comes together with the discussion of our content navigator because we really wanted a way to be able to uh, handle all of this as well as our content navigator, which brings us to, uh, Gordon's tool set, which is called the Pragmatic Praxis Deployment uh, tool set. Um, and this one is very much a part of our Content Navigator solution. So it's really important that you see kind of what the functionality of this thing does. Um, but in addition, uh, I want to explain that it's also doing a lot more than just processing our actual uh, content browser. So uh, a few things that it does. Uh, Gordon started building this, I, I forget the actual year, but I want to say it was seven or eight years ago, maybe nine years ago now. Um, but it handles all of our software deployments. And by all of our deployments, I mean, uh, in a minute, I'm going to show you a virtual machine that was set up last night just for this video today because I needed a second machine. Uh, we'll go over that kind of in a second. So uh, the PX tools, when they're set up, they actually allow you to... Uh, double click a single shortcut. And after you double click the shortcut, you can leave. So this video is actually, I want to say five hours long. Um, but what it's doing is I took a bare machine that had nothing installed on it, not even Microsoft Office. And we double clicked the shortcut that says create the uh, AEC collection version of a parallax machine because we have some BDS suites and some AEC collections. So I double clicked it and I walked away and you can tell because if you look at the clock, this was like 10 o'clock last night. So uh, 11 o'clock last night. And if you're not aware, I've got a three week old baby. So 11 o'clock at night, I'm going to bed. Uh, so, uh, but while I was sleeping, it installed Revit 16, Revit 17, Revit 18, all of the add-ins that we have for all of the versions of Revit and Advanced Steel and Civil 3D and AutoCAD and Fab, Fab, FabCAD MEP and blah, 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 blah. And it just kept going. It's midnight. It's 1 a.m. Uh, it's still running um, and so on and so forth. And uh, so what's important about this is the PX tools uh, basically handle, and by the way, not just Autodesk stuff. They also install our Bluebeam 2017, our Inkscape, our GIMP. Uh, and they also do a lot of interesting stuff uh, that I like to call company management stuff. Um, and what I mean by that is they handle the fact that we've got shortcuts to our servers and to our company handbook on the desktop. They do all of this network drive uh, manipulation. And they also, very conveniently, going back to our content navigator, 
make sure that there is an actual copy of our entire Revit share on the C drive of all the machines. It's not just copied there, it's mirroring there every time we log into the machine. So if you think back to what we said we originally wanted to do, where did I drag the PowerPoint to? That's cool. There we go. If you, drag, if you go back to uh, what I was saying we originally wanted to do, we want to have a copy of the content on the network and a copy on the C drive, and we want to automatically migrate between the two. Okay, so the short version is, I can't get into everything that Gordon's tools do, but they allow much more customization to any piece of software that you want to customize out there. Here's why. Um, when you use an Autodesk deployment or a Bluebeam deployment or any of the software's deployments out there, um, basically they allow you to add in arguments or customizations during installation. There's a lot of things that we want to do that don't happen during installation. So Gordon's tools allow you to basically set up what happens during installation, and it's not all related to the installer. So if you want to modify a registry key, copy a file, mirror a file, alter a file, edit a file, delete a file, whatever, uh, there are things that you can do during the installation of any program. But then there's also a kind of task that you can say, you can say, if I've installed Revit, the first time a user logs in, do this thing. And there's another kind of task that you can say, if I've installed Revit, every time a user logs in, do this thing. And that's basically where we have like our, uh, our content management set up in there. So that entire Revit share that's on my C drive, every single time John or I log into one of our computers, that's checking in the background, is the C drive up to date? Why? Well, in a few minutes, you're gonna see this relocate thing that basically converts a machine from parallax office to parallax office. Um, but if tomorrow I have to go to a client and because, you know, I'm um, a tired asshole, I completely forget to click relocate, I leave and my machine is all still totally path to the network. Wow, that's terrible. But all the content is still on the C drive. So even though Revit is still path to the network, I can still get to my content because it's on the C drive, which is really nice. Um, also, kudos to the CTC team. Uh, the Bimless server, by the way, even though at that point it will be pathed to my Parallax NAS device, which it cannot see because I'm in a client's office and they have no Wi-Fi, it won't freak out and hold Revit hostage the way a lot of content navigators will. Uh, the BIM list server will sit there, it will still show all the content, and only when you try to load a piece of content will it then tell you gracefully, hey, I can't find that piece of content because the server is not available. So that's awesome. Um, problems that I've had in the past are browsers basically holding Revit hostage because they can't connect to their database and then everything just goes to hell. Uh, that's sort of what started me down the road of uh, needing to uh, come up with another solution for content. Uh, so John Pearson had a question uh, in the webinar chat and uh, yeah, so if you think about these three tasks, tasks that you can run during installs, tasks that you can run once as a user or run every day as a user, like managing Dynamo packages. Uh, so, um, those of you who know John Pearson, he joined uh, Parallax a couple months ago to be a part of our team, um, half of our team, as it may be, and uh, I, I kind of forgot to explain this to John, how PX tools work, and then I felt kind of bad, because John was developing new nodes for Rhythm, and when he logged into his machine the next morning, I effectively punched him in the nuts because his new nodes disappeared. Oops. But... Yeah, it's totally true. There is a directory on our server called Dynamo Packages. And anything John puts in that folder, the next time any of us log into any machine in the company, our packages are 100% up to date. So it's totally a true story that if you were to look on Revit Forum five years ago, as uh, John pointed out to me, uh, I was bashing people using Dynamo because it is an implementation nightmare. Um, and now I'm a huge fan of Dynamo, especially after seeing the kind of things that you can do with it that John's been teaching me. But it is totally true. You need a way to manage those packages. So in addition to managing our content navigator, uh, PX Tools becomes that task that can manage your Dynamo packages. Somebody still needs to install them with Package Manager and move them to the network repository. And then they basically copy down to everybody's uh, C drive or roaming app data every time they log in the machine. Quick note about that, a lot of people ask, why don't we just run them off the network? And if you go back a few years to AU presentations, you'll find a presentation where I actually ran all of my add-ins off the network instead of doing this mirroring thing locally. And that was because at the time, uh, PX tools didn't have this functionality. And uh, all the IT guys at my old company basically went uh, bat crazy because I had live DLLs running off the network, which was uh, kind of funny. Anyway. 
the point is, uh, because there are these tasks that you can run every day or on user login, there are also other kinds of tasks that can basically run called relocate. So I'm going to show you one more video, and it's a really quick video. Uh, I think we're actually done with the PowerPoint. So uh, yeah, we'll save it. Why not? So it's a really quick video, which means hopefully you can see what's going on. Let's see here. Really? OK, we'll just we'll navigate there again since I seem to have lost it. Um, essentially, we have a shortcut on the server. Actually, I'll just show you the shortcut. That'll be easier. I'm not going to run it on my machine because it does take a few minutes to run, and I don't want you to all have to sit here. But essentially, this is our directory of PX tool scripts. So if I want to install a machine with the AEC collection that lives in our Dallas office, I double click this one and I walk away. If I want to install one that has our older building design suite ultimate licenses, I click that and I walk away. If I want to install one uh, for John's office, which is what we call Rio Rancho, basically I click, uh, uh, you know what, I actually built yours in Dallas and then hit the relocate button. But here's the button I was telling you about. So relocate a machine to the AEC collections that's in mobile mode. So if you double click that, it, takes, uh, it does take a few minutes to run. Uh, the relocate itself is actually very fast. But then on user login, it's doing a bunch of stuff in the background uh, that you don't really feel, but it still has to do it. So this is sped up, of course. But so here's me basically running the relocate. And you'll see that it does a whole bunch of stuff. And uh, then it logs out of the machine. And then you log back in, and it's basically done. And so this is, we're OK on time. This is a brand new machine, the one that I was showing you in the video, that I have already relocated to what we call uh, mobile mode. And there's a few interesting things that I'll show you about this. Uh, well, first of all, I was looking at the image cache where we can copy the, the, the images to. But you'll see that now I have way less network shortcuts. I have AutoCAD, I have my marketing shortcuts, and I have my Revit directory. But you'll notice that now they're not looking to the server anymore. They're looking to the C drive. But what I'm after is the user experience is the same. It doesn't matter that you know, we're, we're in you know, Heathrow Airport today. I go to my network place, and I click Revit, and I go to something that looks just like the Revit directory. And that's really what I'm after. Um, if I actually launch Revit, What you're going to see, and I meant to keep the database opened, but I accidentally closed it. So I'm going to just open uh, a different file that belongs to, to the CTC database, but it's not the actual uh, it's not the actual database itself. Come on, it's a slow virtual machine. It's not one of the super nice ones that that we have like at conferences and stuff. So be a little patient with my slow VM. Yeah, and my template that's not fully updated yet because that's a whole other story. Let's do what I say, not what I do, and all that good stuff. OK, so this is, this is opening. Uh, this is still taking its time. We'll move that over here for now. Come on. We got a lot going on here. I didn't realize that the, that thing in the background is still exporting pictures. and. Geez, busy day. OK, so here we are. Uh, this, is our, this is our machine that is basically in what we call mobile mode. And what we've done here is actually really interesting. Um, when we logged into this computer, uh, PX tools, Gordon's tools, basically, by the way, this is super creepy. And I, I kind of I, I like this aspect of it. But it basically keeps a log of everything that happens on the machine, uh, both during the install itself. So when I ran that script last night, uh, I basically got a log for that computer. And if you want to see everything that you installed, this is the log. And it will basically tell you how everything went. So here it is, you know, looking at uh, changing some. Oh, this was the relocate. So basically, it, it changed the shortcuts for my AutoCAD commands. So if I were to go look at the AutoCAD shortcuts in the menu on this machine, you would see that they all now point to the profile that is on the C drive instead of the profile that's on the network. Likewise, uh, here is that same file that goes over what happened when I ran the relocate script. It actually opened up. And by the way, let me just say this. This is, uh, this is you know, not officially supported by the CTC team. Uh, 
they're champs about knowing that we're hacking stuff up, but they're, uh, you know, as long as we don't badger them for support uh, about ridiculous stuff like this, they're super cool about it. But what it's done is it's opened up the CTC database files. And in the actual database file, the one that's 480 megs, uh, Gordon's PX tool went through on user login and found 5,625 places I referenced the server address. And everywhere I referenced the server, it changed it to C backslash parallax. So what that's done is it's basically moved me. You'll see over here that this database now says Parallax 2018 mobile, and it does not say the server name. It says local. That means it's not actually tethered to the server right now. Um, and you'll see, though, that the user experience is identical uh, to what we had when we were running off the server. So I have the same exact content tabs, the same exact... Uh, groups. And the only difference is right now, I'm not actually getting any changes that happen on the server side. I'm in temporary isolation mode so that I can go to built or go to AU or travel somewhere or whatever. And as I load these families, um, it's going to be the exact same experience and it's still going to load them correctly. It's just going to load them from the C drive. So if we go to, we'll load in that same family. We can, I mean, we can load in a door. The deal is the doors are already loaded because they're in the template. So that is not, that's not as much fun. Um, that's the other really nice thing about this is, I don't know if you noticed earlier, the families turn blue when they are loaded in your project, which is kind of cool. Uh, so basically, that allows us to repath uh, everything so that we can travel and not have to have a different experience when we're here versus a different experience when we're away. That was one of the fundamental things I was after originally a number of years ago when we were looking at content navigators. But the push to databases has meant that we need to kind of reverse engineer a way to get around that. And so uh, thankfully, Gordon's tool being able to go into some of those files and make modifications to them, combined with Parley's tool being able to generate the preview pictures for them. By the way, these are not all finished preview pictures. Like I ran pig once and then obviously realized, hey, realistic mode was stupid on the door library. So we're going we're gonna to go through and do all these again. Um, and uh, that will basically... Uh, get everything in our final state. So uh, that's basically uh, all, the, all the different tools that I thought would be kind of interesting for, for all of you to see together. Um, I will show you just a couple more, so we have like two minutes to go uh, real quick. But um, part of the driving force behind this is, uh, oh yeah, I see one of the, uh, one of the, one of the journals, uh, one of the image files freaked out, which is kind of funny. Uh, one of the driving forces behind this, right, is you, as I'm sure you, you can tell, we have, uh, we've got more than one Revit library. So we have the one that's on the server that we actually call the Revit library. Uh, and then we obviously have the one on the C drive. And I was telling you that um, uh, the other day I lost about four hours worth of work because I was editing the wrong file. And we actually have a number of different libraries, right? And there was a discussion on Revit forum yesterday about well, what happens when somebody on your project like hits edit family and makes a funky change and then forgets and hits save and it writes over the directory? Well, even though there's only a couple of us here, I mean, that totally happens. And since a lot of these libraries are libraries that we sell, like we want them to be in isolation. So basically Parallax 1 Revit is these are the directories that we're actually using when we're doing modeling work and whatnot. But if we go to the libraries location, a lot of these are redundant copies, but these are the ones that are totally prepped to ship like for clients and stuff. Uh, where that gets interesting is then we also have a copy that's like on the C drive, like we were talking about. And so after that day when uh, I was a dummy and wrote over four hours of my own work, um, John started cooking up this really interesting application that I think I have loaded right now. Um, essentially, um, I'm sure some of you may have seen this on Twitter, our ribbons now change colors based on where I'm working. Uh, which is really great. So if I leave my machine in travel mode like a dummy and I go and open something that's on my C drive, um, essentially, even though it looks like the exact same family and I can't tell, uh, let's just go to the same. If we go down to single, I don't remember which one I'm in. It doesn't matter. But if I go open the door, uh, the ribbon turns obnoxiously red. I know more people were interested in the one that turns red when you haven't synced to central in a while. But this basically tells me when I see bright red, I am in a family that I should completely not be editing because it's going to get wrote over the next time I log into my machine by a copy from the server. 
So we basically have a few different colors. Red is, hey, don't edit me. Purple is, just so you know, you're in the for sale library version. And green is, hey, congratulations, you might have actually opened the right family. Uh, so that's been, uh, that's been pretty handy uh, for me in terms of all these different directories. Um, so uh, anyway, that was kind of uh, the different things that, uh, that we wanted to go over. Um, Hopefully you got something uh, out of it. Uh, if there's any of the stuff that you have questions with, you can, you know, reach out to John or myself or Gordon or Parley or Cody, who's here from CTC. Um, and if you need any of their contact info, you can just reach out to me and I can send it to you. Um, and uh, then you can uh, catch up with those guys uh, about any of these products. And hopefully you can at least get some use out of one thing that we did in the lecture. Um, in your office. And if you need any of these, any of those journal files, like I said, I'll package them up and I'll, uh, I'll include those, uh, in a little email that I'll send out. So, uh, uh, yep. Uh, please share the batch processing files. Will do. So, uh, Hey, happy Friday, everybody. Uh, it's two o'clock or three o'clock or four o'clock, depending on where you are. So it's almost happy hour. Uh, for me with the three week old, it's almost bedtime. And, uh, if you have any other questions, reach out, talk to you all later.